Good evening and welcome. My name is Mike Carruthers and I'm a library donor as well as a member of the Literary Circle Committee. I'd like to begin this evening's event by acknowledging that Toronto Public Library is situated on indigenous land and dish with one spoon territory. This is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Toronto Public Library gratefully acknowledges these indigenous nations for their guardianship of this land. Before I hand things over to our host, let me take a brief moment to highlight tonight's event as being presented by Literary Circle, a group of dedicated donors who invest in the library's highest priority needs. Like many of you, I am grateful for the opportunity to give back to an institution that has given me, my family, and our community so much. It gives me great pride to see how the Toronto Public Library makes such a tremendous impact every day in our city, and never has that been more important than during the past year. If you are interested in learning more about Literary Circle and how your donation can help, I'd encourage you to visit tplfoundation.ca or call the Foundation Office directly. I hope you enjoy tonight's conversation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our host for this evening, Sarah Fulford. Thank you so much, Michael, and hello, everyone. What a great turnout. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sarah Fulford, Chair of the Toronto Public Library Foundation Board. I'm also the editor of Toronto Life Magazine, so tonight I'll be wearing two hats as conversation facilitator and also as library lover, enthusiast, and evangelist. Before we uh, begin, I just wanted to let you know that uh, tonight is live and it's being recorded. Uh, everyone, all of our guests are on mute, but you do have a voice here. There is a Q and A, there'll be a Q and A session and there's a Q and A box. So if you have any questions, and I hope you do, because obviously the best part of any type of discussion like this is audience engagement and questions. So please put your questions in the Q and A box. And if you're experiencing any technical issues, I probably can't help you. I'm not very technologically competent, but the Toronto Public Library Foundation team can assist. And so um, put that in the chat or the Q&A and you will, um, you'll be helped out because they are really capable people. Tonight, we have the opportunity to hear from two exceptional library leaders. And we get to spend the whole evening talking about what makes libraries so great. Our very own city librarian, Vickery Bowles, and joining us from Washington, D.C., is the executive director of the D.C. Public Library, Richard Rays Gavilan. Many of you know Vickery quite well. She is a fierce champion for civic engagement, and she will um, defend uh, civic public discourse even under um, a lot of pressure. It is a marvel to see. Under her leadership, the library with its um, a hundred branches has, has played a huge role in the health and well being of the city, serving diverse communities in thousands of ways, many of which we'll discuss tonight. I have always admired Vickery, but never more than over the past 15 months, as the library has stepped up during the pandemic to provide so many important services when Torontonians needed the library the most digital services, helping people who are feeling isolated, internet connectivity kits, and even transforming libraries into food banks. The other day on a library call, she even mentioned that the library has volunteered it to be a vaccination site uh, as a city, as a branch of the city. Um, there's almost nothing the library can't do. Uh, Richard Ray's Gavilan has worked for almost 20 years in the public library system in New York and Brooklyn public libraries, and he came to Washington, D.C. with his uh, family primarily to oversee the $211 million modernization of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. We'll talk a bit about that tonight. I'm very interested to hear all about it. I believe it was a new Bandero building that needed um, a little love, maybe a lot of love. So that was a six year project that um, we're gonna be hearing about tonight. Not quite open to the public yet, although his background and you can see him on the screen shows what the interior looks like pretty magnificent. Richard is building and renovating neighborhood libraries all over the District of Columbia, winning architectural awards, inspiring innovation, civic empowerment, and delight in patrons. 
Richard and Vickery have another connection. Richard is the current chair of the um, Urban Libraries Council Executive Board, and he took over from Vickery, who is the immediate past chair and also sits on the board. Um, thank you both of you for joining us this evening. Um, we had a chance to chat a little bit before uh, our guests arrived, and I have uh, confidence that my role will be very easy because you have a lot to discuss um, being colleagues and, and facing many of the same challenges and doing so many of the same excellent work, so much of the same excellent work. So the pandemic, um, both libraries uh, went through an extraordinary period over the last um, 15 months, uh, coping with physical shutdowns, but staying very much alive and active and engaged with their communities. Richard, as our um, out of town guest, uh, I'm gonna start with you and ask you how you would characterize the library, the DC's library response to the pandemic and what um, actions the library system took that you're most proud of. Sure, thanks, Sarah. And uh, thanks, Vickery. First of all, let me say that it is an absolute honor to be a part of this conversation. Uh, Vickery is not only uh, the great leader of the Toronto Public Library, but she is absolutely um, a great leader in libraries all over North America. Um, I adore her. Uh, she's brilliant. She's brave. And Toronto Public Library is a beacon of, uh, of inspiration for libraries all over, again, all over, all over the world. So congratulations to you all for having such a wonderful uh, head and such a phenomenal system that does so many great things. Um, so uh, very, very quickly, in response to your, your question about uh, the pandemic, I think libraries have been preparing in some ways uh, for a shift to virtual for, for many years. Um, in fact, I think many of us have bemoaned the fact that residents weren't aware about all the virtual things that we provided, whether they were books, ebooks, learning content, programs. So what the pandemic allowed in some ways was for us to sort of flex our virtual muscle and show off all the great things that we could do online. And I'm really proud of how we did that so seamlessly, literally overnight. Um, you know, there are some concerns, uh, obviously, because we know that the users and consumers of our digital content are in many cases, the people that we need uh, the, to, to reach the least, if that makes sense. Uh, many of our residents who are struggling and underserved um, also have barriers to access to our online resources. And that's something that uh, gives me great pain and uh, really stresses the importance of our physical environment and why when we closed, uh, when we were able to reopen, we, we emphasized opening all of the libraries in underserved parts of the district, because we know that access to computers, um, access to restrooms, um, just even those very uh, basic transactional things uh, make a huge difference in the lives of many of our residents. So that was first and foremost a priority for us. And that was met with uh, a lot of um, uh, support from not only my board, but our elected officials. And that's something that I was really uh, proud of. Proud of. Uh, lots of other things that I can get into. And I think something that I hope to talk about, uh, you know, another thing happened last year in the United States, the murder of George Floyd in, in Minnesota. And this was a crisis within a crisis, especially in Washington, DC, a city that has been historically um, black for many years, uh, a majority black for many years, and now it's just under a majority. And uh, the murder of George Floyd provided the library an opportunity to serve residents in other ways, including by um, you know, hosting conversations about what it means to be anti-racist, uh, providing uh, materials online, uh, the most popular materials in the country, um, uh, that speak to race and also uh, participating in some uh, conversation about what was happening just outside the White House for, for so many days. It was really an incredible year and I'll, I'll hopefully talk some more about it. Thank you. Um, we absolutely should get into that. Um, and I'm, uh, it's not lost on me that you, are, you have the opportunity to reopen the Martin Luther King Jr. Library. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know um, we'll get into that soon about what that name means at this time. Um, so Vickery, about the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Toronto Public Library 
has done some remarkable things. When you look back, and I do hope after this last last <laughs> lockdown and and furious round of uh, vaccinations that we do we do emerge. Um, when you look back, uh, what will you be most proud of in terms of what the library has been able to do to help Toronto during this difficult time? Well, you know, as Rich was talking about, when, when we closed, um, the big push was moving everything online and getting more digital resources available for people to borrow and getting computers to our staff who are all of a sudden going to be working from home. But at the same time that was happening, I was uh, attending meetings at the city um, and um, it, about the emergency response to the pandemic. And, and um, I was hearing about the fact that uh, food banks, which are not part of the city services, they're ran by nonprofits, of course, but they were they were shutting down at, at a, all over the city at a time when, um, of course, they were needed more than ever. And, and they were shutting down because they were, on the one hand, losing locations because those locations where they, the food banks were operating were shutting, were shutting down. And then they were losing a lot of their volunteers because many of the volunteers were seniors and seniors were being told to stay at home. And of course, we had just shut down 100 branches. <laughs> and, and so I went back to uh, you know, my senior team and, and we started talking about it. And we realized pretty soon that um, we, you know, we had these locations that were empty right now in, in across the city. We had staff who were uh, customer service experts. And, um, and we also, you know, we, we organize and um, sort and, and uh, move books around. We could, we could do that for books. We could do that for food too. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, we joined the city's food security table um, and started working with uh, Daily Bread Food Bank, Second Harvest and, um, and uh, North York Harvest uh, as our partners. And we just said, you, you know, this is what we can do. Just tell us what to do and how we can help. And so by the end of March, we had opened, we opened uh, 12 uh, branches um, uh, as food banks. And um, uh, I, um, as part of the process, I emailed our staff and I said, we, we, you know, we need some volunteers to, to work in these food banks. And, and within minutes, literally, I had far more volunteers than we needed. And in the end, about 150 staff participated in the food banks. And, and you know, this was really early in the pandemic when there were shortages of PPE and um, uh, uh, health and safety protocols were still being worked out. And, and we didn't know as much as we do now about COVID. And, but nevertheless, the, you know, the staff really wanted to, to help. And, um, and then at the same time, one of our staff came up with a brilliant idea that, you know, why don't we put a children's book in, the, in each food hamper? And um, so I um, went to Jennifer and the foundation team and I said, you know, can you raise some money for this? <laughs> and in no time, uh, they raised money. We, we, so in the end, what we did was we, we served over 42,000 people um, with, with food hampers and um, um uh, uh, over 4,000 children's books were put into to food pampers thanks to the foundation. And, um, and uh, so I, you know, it was really wonderful to be able to see members of our, our customers, because many of our customers were walking into those branches to get, pick up their food hampers, to be able to, to serve our customers at a time when they were so vulnerable and they really needed that, that, support so that was that was really that's been wonderful and and I would say that an unanticipated result has been that that the library's role in supporting the food bank was really unexpected and it's helped to change the perception of the library with a lot of our stakeholders and with people at city hall um, uh, because you know you know, Rich knows this, we're always saying, well, we're, we're so much more than just books, you know, there's a lot more going on in libraries. And, and all of a sudden, it, people started to realize, well, I guess, you know, there is a lot more that libraries are doing, and they really are part of the community and the community hub. So um, that was kind of an unexpected um, result of, of doing this food bank work. And, uh, but it was tremendously gratifying. And, and, and good for the morale of the staff too, I have to say, in terms of being able to do something as tangible as, as get food to, to people. So one of the things we've been talking about is digital resources. And of course, 
um, we all know the library is much more than books. Um, and we have, so the, the library has so many digital offerings, but buildings are still really important to um, libraries. They perform many, many functions, community hubs. Um, there's certainly a place where you can access books. They're a safe third space, you know, outside of the home or the school or the home or the workplace. Um, Richard, I'm gonna ask you why physical libraries matter. And then I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about um, the process you've gone through recently to uh, renovate and reopen the Martin Luther King Jr. Library. Sure. Um, so, I mean, look, physical libraries matter. I think we, we feel that even those of us who've been working from home for so long, you know, we're social beings, right? You know, we, we wanna be with other people and not just our family. And, you know, many of us choose to live in diverse uh, cities across the world because we want to be people who are different than we are. We want to rub shoulders with people who think differently than we do or think as we do. Um, you know, libraries provide that third space that you alluded to. Um, you know, it's the old classic adage from the, the Ray Oldenburg book from the 1980s about a space that's not school, uh, sorry, a space that's not home, a space that's not work, but a space where you can share ideas. Um, you know, you think about what's happened in the States over the past few years with the proliferation of misinformation, uh, the, 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 the continued uh, segregation of thoughts and, and individuals. And you think of what institution exists that brings people from all walks of life, uh, whether rich or poor, black or white, into one space uh, to listen to a musician or an author or participate in a, in a children's program. I mean, you know, libraries are, are, are just uh, incredibly democratic in a way that there is just nothing, nothing else um, th that can come close. And the virtual library is not that, that space. A virtual library, I think, is much more homogeneous than the physical library. Uh, mm -hmm. And our statistics bear that out, uh, which is why we need physical buildings. I mean, every time we open a neighborhood library here, um, the visitation skyrockets. Uh, mm -hmm. We're opening a brand new library on Saturday and just the, the anticipation is so palpable. So, um, you know, again, uh, speaking specifically uh, for, for urban libraries and in, in cities like Toronto, DC and other places, libraries offer so much more than you can get um, uh, in your home. And, and it's just that thirst and need for, for community that, uh, that I think drives us um, every day when, when we open our doors. It's, uh, it's, it's incredible and, and we've missed it sorely over the past year. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe I'll pause there and just ask Vicar if you have anything to add on that about the value of the physical space of the library. I know that um, you know, with a hundred branches, there's always several renovations on the go. Mm -hmm. um, I live not too far from the Witchwood branch. It looks better and better every day. Um, <laughs> what is involved for you in renovating and overhauling a community branch? And what is that process like? Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about why that's so important. Well, you know, public space is the way we deliver our, our, a lot of our services. But public space is in and of itself a service as well. Um, and, and having access to that public space is an important community resource. Um, when we go to renovate or um, rebuild a branch, we, you know, there's a really extensive public consultation process that we, we um, go through because we need to make sure that, that those, the branches that we're renovating or rebuilding are reflective of the community that we're serving. And every, like, like what Rich is doing in DC, every community is different. And, and so every library needs to re reflect those, the, the needs of that community. So there's a very extensive public consultation um, process that involves focus groups and charrettes with children and um, uh, uh, town halls and architects uh, showing uh, different um, uh, images to, to generate ideas and to gather input. So it's a really important part of the whole process. And, um, and, and, it, and, and one of the important things that I think libraries do and, and is, is 
we are creating beautiful public space and there's an aesthetic there that, that um, we bring to communities, often to communities that are historically underserved so that our branches are saying to those communities, this community deserves beauty. This, this community deserves culture um, like any other community in the city, not just in, in places you know, in the downtown where a lot of cultural institutions already exist. And so, um, you know, the Albion branch up in Rexdale, um, when, we, when we did the public consultation for that branch, people actually, when they found out that we'd have to be closed for over a year in order to, to renovate the branch, um, they said, forget it. We, we don't want, you know, we, we, we can't lose our library for that long. So what we did was we ended up um, built, rebuilding the whole branch, instead of renovating, we rebuilt the branch in the parking lot so that the ex current branch could stay open. And then, um, uh, and then we could tear down the, the old branch. But um, people, uh, people want their public space. They really rely on it. And they, they come to the library to collaborate, but they also come to, li to the library to be alone together. Because as Rich is saying, you know, we're all social beings. We want to have that connection with other people. Um, even if we're not interacting with them directly, we want to be with them and around them. And so that public space and how we build them, how we renovate them um, um, is really, really an important part of the work that we do. Um, I'll, I'll um, jump in. Go ahead. Just, just to respond to that momentarily, Shara, if that's okay. Um, you know, one of the things that we, um, that we see with all of our new building projects um, uh, around community engagement is that there is just a fierce, fierce ownership of buildings from mm -hmm. community members. And you know, whenever I shepherd a new library project, you know, I convey the fact that you know this is not my library. You know, I, I work here. You know, my job is to facilitate the conversations between the community and the architect in order to create a space that really is responsive to the specific needs of that, of that community. And if we do that successfully, um, when we have our grand opening, everyone sees something in that building that um, is an aspiration that they may have had during the whole, whole design process. But it is absolutely crucial. And uh, from the sound of what Vickery is saying, they are spending as much time in Toronto as we are during that preliminary information mm -hmm. gathering phase it, you know, we'll do that for a year, all the focus groups, the plenary sessions, uh, meeting with individual elected officials to, you know, tell me about your aspirations. You know, how can this library be something that speaks to you? Unlike the library, just, you know, a, a mile or two down the road, this is for you and for your children and for your parents. So how can it, how can it be yours? It's really, it's, it's uncanny that, that, that sense of ownership which is why I'm also, you know, I'm never offended when people get mad at me during a lot of these meetings because it, it just shows their, their love and passion for, for this community resource. I see mm -hmm. that as a sense of uh, we're doing something right when people are really upset about the, pers the prospect of possibly losing their library for a period of time for a renovation or a, uh, a full rebuild. So now that you're six years into this Martin Luther King Jr. renovation, you're on the cusp of opening it to the public in a couple weeks, which is very exciting. Congratulations. What, what are the things that you love about it? What are the things that make you the most excited and happy about the new space that you've, you've ushered into the world? Um, sure. Well, Nick, first of all, I mean, just on the surface, the building was a horrible, horrible, horrible example of what libraries should be in terms of, uh, you know, libraries should speak to, to residents and, and profess that their, their respect for residents. Uh, they should be dignified, open spaces. And the building that we had for many years was not that. It was very much a transactional space where you would go to get whatever you need and leave. So we needed to create within the framework of a historic Mies van der Rohe building, uh, we needed to, to turn the interior of that building completely around and make it um, inspirational with high ceilings and lots of natural light and fill, fill it with delight. Um, it's hard, you know, uh, the TD Center in Toronto, when you're inside, you're not necessarily filled with awe or, or maybe you are. Um, so converting a, a Mies building is, is not easy uh, w when you have other options for, for, new, for new libraries. But what I'll say in terms of what makes me the, the, the happiest 
and you know, I don't want to get too too deep into DC history, but you know, DC is two very different cities. There is the local city uh, full of 700,000 residents who don't have voting representation in Congress, uh, largely because DC has been a historically black city. And then you've got the federal city, which is a city full of monuments and Smithsonian museums and a legacy that is something that is you know, something that we're all still reckoning with. The Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library in Washington, DC represents uh, the most important civic structure built primarily for the use and enjoyment by district residents. It mm -hmm. is not necessarily built for tourists. It is not built for people coming in from other parts of the country. And there is an incredible source of pride for residents in any state, even when the building was run down, people loved that building because it was something that belonged to DC residents. And so uh, having the honor of overseeing a project that amplifies DC resident voices in a way that speaks to the pain of, uh, of uh, generations of, of racism, that speaks to the joy of DC neighborhoods, that doesn't speak at all to the Washington Monument or the Smithsonian mm -hmm. or all these great institutions, they're great, but they're not DC for the people who are from DC. And I'm still learning. I've only been in Washington DC for seven years. I will never be a native, but I have heard um, long and hard about what people expect from that building. And we've, um, I, I wish that we could do a tour of it even virtually and I can just go floor by floor about how that building speaks to um, the, the 700,000 residents of DC and, their, uh, and the generations of residents who, who, who came before them. Um, you open in a few weeks and, and hopefully the Toronto Public Library System, our branches will open up soon. As the library transitions from the pandemic era into the God willing post pandemic era, um, I'll start with you, Vickery, and ask you how you see the role of the library in helping, you know, what is a sort of traumatized population, a population that has been many, many people have lost jobs. Um, uh, what is the role of the library, which is, you know, overwhelmingly funded by the taxpayers of Toronto with a little support from our friends at the foundation? Um, how, what is, what is it, uh, uh, mission in the post-pandemic uh, rehabilitation of the city? Well, one of the, you know, there's a, a lot of work for us to do in rebuilding, and, and some of it has to do with workforce redevelopment. Um, you know, one of the, our, the streams of, of programming that we've developed uh, and, and a, a priority in our strategic plan um, has, has been workforce redevelopment. And, and the reason for that is because of all of the um, economic disruption that's taken place, um, the, the, um, uh, the technological disruption. And then of course, um, the, um, uh, uh, the pandemic has been so disruptive and, and there's so much rebuilding that has to happen. So a new kind of workforce development uh, programming stream that we've developed um, has been this IT training and certification course with wraparound support. And when I say wraparound support, that's library staff providing support to ensure learner success. So some of you may be familiar with our work to design um, uh, a, a Google IT professional cer certificate uh, program. And, and we've done that um, with a grant from Google and uh, with the support of the, of the foundation. And it's been a two year, two cohort program uh, that recently ended. And it funded about 500 Canadian residents from across Canada. And these residents were in marginalized communities. And so um, it, it's been an important program for us because uh, we've tested out this model where we have an online program and cohort. It's an eight month program that people are in, engaged in um, with a recognized uh, Google um, certification. And, um, uh, and, and the support that the, the, the participants get from the library staff has been really critical to the success of the program. Um, when we went into the agreement with Google, uh, they, they had a target uh, 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 completion rate of 45%. Um, and, um, 
and but we actually achieved a remarkable 76% completion rate uh, as a result of the fact that the, the model really worked for people. And it was and it was a really intensive eight month program that people were involved in. And we've started to do some of the evaluation and we found that um, for those who completed the, the program, 26 learners gained new employment um, and, and over 70% of the respondents pursued further skills um, upgrading in, in IT. And so we're really hoping to add more kind of industry recognized certifications using this model um, going forward to, to provide um, uh, kind of workforce uh, development and skills development. And we know that there's a real focus on IT, especially with the, all the accelerated digital uh, move that we've all gone through with the, with the pandemic. So that's an example of an area that we're really focused on. It's a priority in our strategic plan. And it's something that we're really um, hoping to do uh, more with, uh, it, you know, hopefully maybe with Google, we would like to do more with Google, but if not with Google, with other partners uh, in the IT sector uh, to be able to provide this kind of um, certification uh, program. I think it, it's, a, it's a model that has worked well for us. And I think it, it uh, has really strong outcomes uh, for individuals in terms of uh, um, uh, their careers and, and uh, job situations. Richard, when you look out into the post-pandemic future, uh, how do you see the library helping DC and its residents recover? Um, sure. So, um, you know, our, our mayor here uh, in DC, the, the wonderful Mayor Muriel Bowser, has outlined three priorities for getting DC residents back up on their feet. Uh, one is education recovery. Um, you know, how do we get the learning loss that took place over the past 15 months? How do we make up for that? And what role can every agency, including the library play there? And we've got obviously a lot to do um, in, that, in that arena. Um, there's workforce support, um, like, like Vickery was saying. Um, uh, we also uh, have a cert certification program. It's a Microsoft Office certification program that is hugely popular. Um, we partner with the, um, the the state education office here in DC, uh, uh, and I, I don't have the numbers of, of successful completions, but it's a, a phenomenal, phenomenal program that we offer through the through the library. Um, another workforce uh, program that we will be launching with the reopening of the Martin Luther King Library downtown is we've got a, a great partnership with an organization here called DC Central Kitchen, which mm. uh, provides uh, sort of cafe services in, in local establishments, but they also work um, uh, to provide training for, for local employees uh, to get them uh, to their next uh, level of um, it, it improve their employability for things like hospitality, restaurant work, um, and, and other industries. So not only are you working at the cafe, but we are ensuring that this is not your last stop on the career ladder, but rather just your first stop. Um, we're also proud as part of this partnership to work with uh, Chef Jose Andres, who I'm sure you all know is mm -hmm. uh, just a phenomenal um, uh, powerhouse for equity um, across the, the world but his restaurant is, um, one of his restaurants, Zaytenia, is across the street from the MLK library. So years ago, he actually approached um, uh, me to say, hey, I wanna work with you uh, when this library reopens in a few years. Oh, wow. So we're really uh, jazzed about that. <laughs> and, um, and then the third priority is an interesting one uh, because it's not something that is in the library sweet spot, but as Vickery can tell you, uh, libraries have a, a, a great way of making everything our sweet spot, and that's gun, <laughs> gun violence prevention. We are absolutely in a gun, um, I mean, the United States has, has been in a gun violence epidemic for years, but in, in Washington, D.C. specifically, uh, gun violence rates have gone up precipitously over the past um, few years, including the pandemic year, and the mayor has challenged um, all agencies to think about what we can do in this arena and libraries as being sort of trusted safe spaces, especially for um, you know, some of our disconnected youth, we do think that there's a, a, a space for us here. Last year, or actually two years ago, we launched a program called the Credible Messenger Program. And it's a program that we work in concert with um, the Department of Behavioral Health here in, um, in DC. 
I'm sorry, no, the Department of Youth Rehabilit Rehabilitative, Rehabilitative Services. And the credible messengers are basically kids, uh, meaning people in their 20s uh, or 30s with lived experience of uh, being in gangs or being in the criminal justice system. Uh, we employ them and they're uh, doing one-on-one -on -one programs and doing all sorts of programs with, um, with visitors to the library in a way that our library staff can't understand. And this is no knock on library staff, but you know, we don't have that lived experience or the credibility. And that's where we get the credible messengers from. Um, that's just one idea. I mean, we wanna think through how else we can be supportive here, but uh, clearly we, um, if the mayor is successful, we, we, then, then the library will be well-funded. I think that that's um, um, a, a real easy uh, equation to think through. So we want to help her with those goals because we know that that will make the library successful in the long run. Mm -hmm. One of the really cool programs that I only learned about because I was affiliated with the Library Foundation is the um, Toronto Public Library community librarian effort. I didn't. Right. I imagined librarians were people who worked in library buildings and put books on shelves. And um, the more I got to understand how the library worked, I learned about these people who work directly in the community, delivering library services with all the values of equity and inclusion. Um, Vickery, could you talk a little bit about our community librarian program in Toronto and where you see it going in the future? Sure. Um, well, you know, libraries, we, we, we deliver our services in branches that increasingly we deliver services online as well but we're also delivering um, services in communities and so that and because that's where we can reach and serve people at their point of need so uh, during the pandemic we have continued to develop our community librarian work and so for instance we've had community librarians supporting uh, shelter residents um, in entering or re-entering in some cases the workforce through um, online sessions with our uh, community librarians. Normally, of course, our librarians would go into the shelters to work with people um, uh, on site, but during the pandemic, those sessions have, have become virtual. And um, we are, we're working in partnership with the city shelter staff uh, to help shelter residents um, with these one-on-one -on -one sessions. And the work that they've been doing has really been focused on employment opportunities. Um, we've been helping to develop digital literacy skills. Uh, we've been uh, working with um, on developing on them, people understanding the online resources that are available to them, how to access those resources. And a lot of it, as I said, has to do with employment. Um, there's been a real interest in sp sp small business um, and entrepreneurship, and, and then also online training. How can they people upgrade their skills online uh, using the library resources? So the community librarians is a really important uh, model of service that we started developing and, uh, and putting a lot of effort into a few years ago. And it, it we, um, uh, as I said, we, we moved it all online uh, during the pandemic, uh, but we are planning on using this model of service, we'll, which will also be online, but we will also, of course, be moving out into the community to work on site in places like the John Howard Society uh, as people uh, transition, transition out of prison um, and uh, other areas where there's a, a really people are, are vulnerable and they need a lot of supports too. Um, re-enter uh, the workforce in, in, uh, for whatever reason they, they're, they're not in the workforce right now. So we're really working um, uh, with our, to develop that community librarian work and uh, it is a fundraising initiative with, uh, with the foundation as well um, so that we can get more community librarians on the ground to, so, so to speak uh, and into the community to, to work with people who really need that extra support. Um, I'm turning my attention to some of the questions in the Q&A from our audience. And there's a question that I love, um, which has to do with <clears throat> fundraising and specifically how does a municipally funded agency like the library integrate private uh, donations? And what is the value of those donations to um, the library? I mean, I. Uh, as the moderator, I don't really want to answer that question, but maybe, Vickery, I can tee you up um, because um, there have been a couple occasions when the foundation has been able to raise money for a pilot project in order to demonstrate 
their merit in the community, their the popularity and the value to the municipal government, which just makes it a lot easier for the city government to say, oh yeah, that's a really important project, let's fund it. And then of course, um, quite recently, I was very proud to be involved in some of the fundraising efforts to raise money for our digital connectivity kits during uh -huh. the pandemic when everyone's lives, educational, employment, social was online, the library came to the foundation and said, there's a need in the community for these kits. And Vickery, maybe you could take it from there and describe what happened after that. Yes, well, absolutely. That's a great example of how you can, how the foundation support will um, allow us to pilot a project, uh, show that, that we're serving a really important need, um, get metrics to prove you know the value and the results and and then take it to the to city hall and say you know we really need funding for this so um uh you know we we found out that through you know uh, the digital divide is something we've been talking about for a long time the pandemic really amplified the digital divide in so many ways and it wasn't just that it, you know, that people didn't have access to the internet or Wi-Fi at home. Um, when libraries closed, what we realized, there are a lot of people that they just don't have a device at all. They don't have a laptop. They don't have a smartphone. Um, they have nothing. And, and so um, when we, um, in working with our community partners, and, and they identified that this was a serious issue uh, for our most vulnerable residents in the, in the city, um, we came up with this idea of an internet connectivity kit, and this is a, um, a laptop, um, a Wi-Fi hotspot with two years of unlimited data and a laptop bag, and that's the kit. <laughs> and, um, and so we had a nonprofit partner that was, um, was interested in getting us the laptop. The foundation got us the, the data, paid for the data and the Wi-Fi hotspot. And we, and so we started working with our community partners in the uh, city's emergency response table to the, and they identified the participants. And of course, within no time, the, we, the kits were all gone, they were all distributed and their community partners were saying, well, we, we need more. <laughs> so uh, we went to the foundation, the foundation you know, did some wonderful fundraising um, and very quickly we um, donors stepped up and we got um, more uh, funding from the foundation to get to purchase more of these kits. And it soon, this, this program, um, um, we, we, uh, the people at the city from the emergency response table were talking about what a difference this program was making for residents in the city. And so then the city uh, uh, stepped up and um, allocated um, several hundreds of thousands of dollars um, for these internet connectivity kits so, um, so that we could purchase more of these kits and uh, as a pandemic response. And, and I have to say, the program is a pandemic response. There's no question. It's a Band-Aid solution. Uh, people need computers. They need access to the internet. And normally they can get that through the library. But when we're closed, that wasn't possible. And so I, I do want to just take a moment and thank all of the donors who helped with this tremendous program. Because if it wasn't for this program, we wouldn't have been able to reach all of these people. And, and people who have these kits, it's just absolutely transformed their lives. They've got access to health and social uh, connections that they need. They have access to government information and financial uh, assistance that they need. They can make connections with family and friends and with their kids' school. And it's, it's been absolutely a tremendous program. Um, and it really shows the value of when you can get some seed money from the foundation um, and, and demonstrate to stakeholders the importance of a, of a particular program, it can lead to, to more funding and it, and, it, and it becomes operationalized as a regular part of, it, of your work. Um, Richard, do you have any examples of, obviously the library that you've recently renovated was supported in, in some part by donors um, what is the relationship between donors and your library system? Um, well, you know, my, my pitch to donors is that, you know, the, the city is responsible for the meat and potatoes of library work. Uh, they turn the lights on, they make sure that the buildings are clean, that you've got smart staff members welcoming, welcoming them every day. But private philanthropy is really what makes us uh, shine, uh, frankly. And if I might highlight one program from the pandemic that um, 
that was entirely due to the great work of the DC Public Library Foundation, I would highlight a program called Know Your Power. Um, um, here in Washington, DC, we spend a lot of time talking about issues around social justice and knowing your power and how to amplify your voice in ways that um, will help you, um, you know, express your frustrations, your, your aspirations, and everything in between. So Know Your Power is a program funded by Pepco, which is the local power company um, here. And it is a program that uh, encourages teens to uh, express their power through music, literature, photography, and, um, and art, and encourages them uh, to submit um, uh, examples of all this great work. And we've got a, a PEPCO team that evaluates this work. Hundreds and hundreds of teens from across the city uh, participated all summer long. Winners were able to get um, uh, you know, new musical instruments, uh, high, high uh, performance camera equipment, um, and things that will make their art even easier to do. Um, we had a great uh, virtual ceremony. And uh, for me, it showed just how um, incredible the reach was, even during the pandemic, for kids who may have the skills uh, to interact with the library, but may not have uh, the equipment that, uh, that can help them advance their, their art. And that, again, was uh, due to a um, half a million dollar gift from from uh, from this uh, from from Pepco, and that will carry us for at least three years. And of course, this whole proof of concept idea that Vickery mentioned is is crucial. Um, in order to operationalize just about anything, we often need the seed funding uh, from uh, from a foundation gift, and it can be sometimes very small, but uh, but you often need it um, when you're dealing with you know skeptical city managers who frankly have lots of mouths to feed. So. Uh, so foundations, uh, donors to Toronto uh, Public Library Foundation, thank you. Because um, also, what you know, in libraries are you know we we copy each other all, all the time. Um, so a successful program in Toronto will become a successful program in cities across the United States, and vice versa. We we are nothing but great sharers of information. So understand that every dollar you donate has not only the power to change. Uh, the lives of people living in Toronto, but frankly, people living all over the, the U.S. and Canada too. Mm -hmm. um, that's very inspiring to hear. And of course, the Toronto Public Library has the Sun Life funded musical instrument lending library, which um, provides a similar service, of empowering kids with access to instruments that they might not have otherwise. Um, Vickery, we have two different questions from our audience about seniors. Obviously the pandemic um, was especially cruel to our older population mm -hmm. and for a variety of reasons. Um, one of our audience members mentioned um, that librarians and library staff called uh, seniors who were feeling isolated to connect with them, a wonderful service. Um, another person in our audience is asking about whether there should be community librarians that work in long-term care facilities. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested to know how the library interacts with, serves its uh, senior population? Well, during the pandemic, you know, um, uh, I'll start with that. Uh, we, um, we started calling seniors um, in June, I guess it was. Uh, and these were just wellness calls. And these are, so we started, so, so we called about 10,000 seniors, 80 years and older. Um, and, um, and people were absolutely thrilled. And I, it was, I have to say, it was another one of those situations where the staff were just so gratified in, you know, making the calls. I think they, you know, when they started, they were a little hesitant because they weren't sure how people were going to react. And, um, but, you know, it was just, it was wonderful. And people were surprised that, you know, they were hearing from the library and uh, we weren't telling them to pick up their hold. We were telling them, we were just calling to say, um, 
you know, we're just calling to, to check in and make sure you're okay. And you know, can we help you? Sometimes we'd help with, uh, you know, they needed uh, trying to, they're trying to, you know, having trouble with eBooks or something or accessing something on the website, but others that, you know, they didn't have that digital access and, and they just appreciated a phone call and a friendly um, voice on at the end of the line. So, uh, and then we moved on to, um, uh, people 70 years and older, there are about 25,000 people we called there. Then later, um, uh, we got we were contacted by the city because at, once the city started the vaccination program, um, there were people 80 years and older, um, uh, a smaller percentage, there's a was was not the take up of uh, getting vaccinations in that age group that they had hoped. <clears throat> and I think it, part of the issue was uh, um, not clear, there wasn't a lot of clarity about how to get your vaccination and maybe people just needed the some information about the process. So they asked us, could we start making phone calls again? So we did, we started phoning uh, people and um, just uh, these were vaccination calls just to tell them about the vaccination process. And, and, and we've, you know, we've done all the 80 plus and we, we're working on people 70 years uh, to 79. Um, so that's, you know, that's something that we're doing um, right now. We've also had a seniors tech help line um, for people specifically having difficulty with technology and um, and uh, so we have uh, uh, about 10 staff trained in well, very heavily trained in technology so that they can help um, um, whether it's library resources or some sort of connectivity issue they've got or, or whatever. So, so that's been going on through the pandemic. Of course, regularly, we have all sorts of in-branch programs for seniors um, uh, and uh, uh, book clubs. We have um, our um, uh, we, we do go into long-term care homes normally with uh, people delivering books and uh, resources to, to people in long-term care homes. Um, a few years ago, there was a, a suggestion that, you know, maybe we could mail those in, but we soon realized that, that part of the service is uh, uh, making a connection with a person, with a staff person. And so we quickly abandoned any idea of mailing books to people and uh, realized that the important part of the service is, is really um, is uh, that interaction with a, with a, with a human being. And it kind of speaks to public space again, um, and the fact that people need that social interaction. And seniors certainly need that social interaction. We, we know that people, um, seniors especially, can be really can become isolated, and it's important to make those connections. So um, we're, we, we are part of this, the city senior strategy, um, where we are working, uh, we have an account ability table where we all work together um, to, to um, from all of our various perspectives to work on how we can serve seniors uh, in this city and um, serve their various needs because of course seniors uh, are not a, a one group um, they have they're all seniors at, at all sorts of different stages I'm a senior <laughs> apparently <laughs> and uh, um, uh, and uh, so people uh, need uh, 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 support at all different st stages of their of their senior years, and and we need to respond to that. So we're working very hard uh, to do that uh, within the context of the pandemic, or in our regular services, and within the context of the work that the larger group of uh, people are doing at the city. Um, Richard, I'm going to ask you probably the final question of the evening, which comes from one of our audience members, um, and then I'll. I'll start wrapping up. What has the pandemic taught you about what you need to do for your community post pandemic? Like were there any specific eye opening? And of course, particularly in DC, you mentioned the civil rights movement um, after George Floyd's murder. And so the, pen, the crisis within a crisis. Um, what did you learn over this past year that you will be applying to your work going forward? I'm sure a, a, a great question with no no easy answer. Um, you know, I think one one thing that um, that really did uh, dawn upon me, um, you know, this idea of of the, the digital divide, which you know we've been talking about for for years and years and years, and you know, one of the things that I've said um, over and over is that, uh, you know, I think many people have just sort of uh, gotten tired of people who've lost who don't have access. Um, they, they don't see it as a real problem because it is so ubiquitous in the lives 
of so many of us. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen is, you know, people who have access only have access through a phone and they have entirely skipped this notion of having a desktop computer. Of mm -hmm. course, here in DC, and when you wanted to apply for unemployment insurance, you needed to do it through a desktop computer. You couldn't do it through a phone, which mm -hmm. created a just, it was chaos in this city. And one of the things that I realized, especially when we were able to reopen some of our branches so that um, residents could come in and apply for something as basic as unemployment insurance is that you know, we can't lose sight of uh, just the fundamentals that libraries provide that oftentimes we don't talk about sometimes when we're talking to funders. Um, the fact that we provide here in DC alone, you know, 1000 networked computers and expert staff to help navigate this process is something that I'm gonna talk about all the time. Uh, and I probably talked about 10 years ago and stopped talking mm -hmm. about it, but need to talk about it again. Uh, libraries provide just a fundamental, I mean, it's like, it's like running water. Um, libraries provide uh, uh, lifelines to, uh, to not only access to information, but uh, lifelines to participation in, in, in life, right? Um, applying for a job, uh, applying for healthcare, all these things um, are, 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 are so crucial and libraries are playing a really important role there. So that's one. And then there are some other ones that uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll, I'll stop there. But the, the culture piece, uh, the anti-racist work is something that if you would asked me a few years ago, how central is that to the mission of the library? I would have said it's important, but not um, not a top priority. But I, I would I would disagree with that sentiment now and say that it mm -hmm. is a top priority for us. Fascinating. Um, Thank you, Vickery and Rich, for sharing such great insights about the important work that you do at the library. Um, to all our TPL donors who are with us here tonight, thank you for your very generous support. Um, if you've joined us as a guest, then I encourage you to get involved with the library, become a donor. For details on how you can join the Literary Circle, who hosted this evening, uh, check out the membership section on the foundation's website or call the foundation office directly. Um, if you're watching from somewhere other than Toronto, I'll just end by saying, go ahead and support the, the library in your community because it needs your support and it's a great investment in where you live. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Rich. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Vickery. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. That was my pleasure.